Um, yeah, so this is being recorded. This will get put up on our YouTube channel. You guys will get an email with the link later on. Don't feel the need to kind of write obsessive notes um, as we're going through this. So today we're going to talk about some common vegetable garden pests and issues that may arise as you kind of progress through the gardening season. So I'd like to bring your attention to the poster that's on here. Um, as University of Maryland Extension receives federal funds, we fall under a USDA. Um, we do offer equal access programming to all. So if you need any kind of accommodations, I know that closed captioning is enabled on Zoom. Um, so if you need closed captioning, you can go down to the bottom of your screen. And I believe um, there's either a button that says caption or under the more. It's a caption option. If you're having difficulties with that, you can put it in the chat and hopefully Haley can help you figure it out. Um, if you need any other kind of reasonable accommodations, please put them in the chat. If you have any questions as we're going through this presentation, you can also put those in the chat and then I will address them either periodically throughout the presentation or at the very end, I will um, questions as well. And again, this is being recorded, so it'll get put up on YouTube so you guys will have access to it as well. So anyone who's been to my talks knows that I like to share my resources up front. In particular, especially when we have topics like this, there's a lot of information. I could give an entire hour to hour talk about insects and disease issues that would arise on any one vegetable. I have one on potatoes. I have one on squash. I have one on all of these. So there's going to be a lot of information coming through here, and I'm not going to be able to address everything that could possibly be on any vegetable crop in your backyard. So I like to share my resources up front. If you live in Maryland, um, the University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center has has some amazing resources. It's where I recommend their Maryland Grows blogs and their Asked Extension down at their page allows you to submit pictures and ask questions for our experts directly. You can also reach out to your county extension agents as well. Most counties have a home port slash master gardener coordinator who can help you. They also have master gardeners that will have plant clinics, usually in the summer at things like farmers markets or libraries where you can bring samples and ask questions. Um, if you live outside of Maryland and are looking for just some general home and garden information. Our website is open, but some other ones would be like University of Massachusetts, if you live more up in the Northeast area. Clemson, if you're in the like Midwest. Um, Missouri Botanical Gardens has a great one. And then Cornell has a list that they update about disease resistant variety, which is super helpful because those include both ones that um, yard gardeners can get access to as well as farmers can get access. So if you were to go to our website, um, if you were to put into like Google, you'd put an HGIC for the Home and Garden Information Center and then UME for University of Maryland Extension. You could put in up in our search bar things like squash or tomatoes, vegetables. I mean, you get something in our search thing like this. So we have tabs that would have the common problems you'd have with squash, common problems you'd have potatoes. I think we have one for cucumbers and one for eggplant. Um, and then we just have some general ones as well. So pretty much all the information I'm going to talk about today is available on our website as well in more detail. So for example, here's what the squash one looks like. So here's two diseases that squash plants can get. If you scroll down, there'd be insects, there'd be nutrient deficiencies, there'd be all kinds of stuff like that. So that kind of goes my dirty of where you can find some further information um, about what I'm going to talk about today. So if you're starting to feel overwhelmed or if I'm moving too quick, definitely ask questions, but all this information is available on our website. When it comes to a pet, I always like people to take a step back and answer the question like, what is a pet? When we talk about garden pests, we're talking about living organisms that cause economical or aesthetical damage, and that's significant damage. So things like a dandelion being in your turf grass, not causing you any actual physical harm. I wouldn't call it a pest. Some people would, some people wouldn't. So when we're talking about pest management, particularly in our vegetable garden, you need to ask yourself, like, is this little bit of feeding really going to cause a yield reduction? Is it really going to cause damage or can I let it go? Um, when it comes to pests, these would include things like insects, weeds, mites, nematodes, and disease-causing things, so bacteria, viruses, and fungus, and then invertebrates like rabbits and deer. Since I have a degree in entomology, we're mainly going to focus on insects. I've got a few slides about diseases that are commonly found in vegetable production. Um, but this talk's mainly going to focus on insects. And then when it comes to controlling those pests in our gardens, I encourage um backyard gardeners to do what we call integrated pest management. So this is a decision-making process um, that you're using both control and management strategies to basically control those pest populations. So you can use different control tactics and management strategies in order to reduce that pest population and keep it below that economical 
damage. I like to tell people that they can think about this like medical system. So we do a lot of things, eating healthy and drinking water and exercising to sort of prevent large medical issues from coming up. And it's the same thing in your garden, doing things like harvesting promptly, cleaning your tools, getting a soil test, watering properly can reduce the likelihood of a lot of issues arising in your garden which then allows your plants to kind of outgrow a little bit of feeding damage done by beetles or caterpillars. Um, if you prompt, if you're prompt with your harvest, if you're, you can really reduce say like fungal diseases from happening and stuff like that. So think about all these different strategies together. Um, and there is a talk. I think I did a whole talk on integrated pest management last year. It's up on the YouTube. So you can review that. We're going to focus a little bit more today on like actual issues and identifying them more so than a lot of the management, but I'll give you guys some control strategies for each one. So when it comes to having issues, issues in your garden. Diagnosing is probably the hardest thing that a lot of people deal with. Like you can see that there are issues in your garden, but you can't really control them if you don't know what the cause of the issue is. So some tips I give people for general diagnosing of plant problems, and this would be both vegetable production, fruits, as well as like just your basic landscape plant. Um, this procedure works for all of them. I'm not going to touch on landscape plants, but our home and garden information center has tons of information about those bushes and trees and all that. So you you can definitely um, find similar information there as well. So the first thing I always say is define your problem. Is it really a problem? Is a small amount of feeding on one leaf on a plant that's knee high really a problem? You know, if your plants are you know smaller than a Coke can, that feeding could be an issue, especially if it's on the major leaves. But once your plant becomes knee high or higher, feeding normally, your plants can recuperate from. So is this a problem or not is sort of your first general question. Then you want to gather some information, look for some patterns. Is it happening only to one type of vegetable crop? Is it happening across your entire garden? Um, is it happening on one side? Where is it on the top of the plant? Is it on the bottom of the plant? Um, what's the water been like the past week? What's the weather been like? Um, and sort of look for some patterns. And then from there, you can kind of deduct and eliminate what you think the problem could be. Um, and I generally tell people, keep an open mind and avoid guilt by association. A lot of times we'll say like, there's an insect on my plant, that insect has to be the cause. That 99% of the time is not likely it um because there's a lot of insects that are out there that don't have the right feeding damage that would match a lot of them are just living their lives so so here's an example that i kind of like to give so here are four different tomatoes with four different types of damage using that process of deduction you could figure out what each one of these was and what the cause was. So this very first tomato that we're seeing here, we see that there's damage at the base of the tomato plant um, and it's sort of soft, it's smudgy. Um, some people would say like, oh, this is probably a disease issue. We have this one here. We're also, we're seeing similar type of thing. There's a marking, but in this case, it's on the side of the plant. And then here you've got some black ring-like formations where it's sunken and wet looking. And then here, oops, we see that there's a big dark black in it. So, you know, through those deductions, you could potentially figure out maybe like what the cause of each one of these would be. So this first one is what we call blossom end rot. It's a nutrient deficiency slash overabundance of water. Um, this one would be sun scold. So in this case, this is a tomato that is in a very sunny spot. It's getting lots of intense sun. And it basically has given the tomato a version of like a sunburn. Then we have an actual fungal disease and then we have insects. So when it comes to insects in particular, again, we want to avoid that guilt by association because we have a lot of beneficial insects that are out in the environment. And these would be what we would call our biological control agents. So these are things like ladybird beetles. These are parasitic wasps. These are lace wings and stuff like that. So these are our predatory insects that are out there feeding on a lot of our pest insects. So I talked about IPM having lots of different control tactics. Um, so this is sort of like, if you think back to the old food pyramid, we want to do a lot of what's on the bottom and very little on the top. Um, so we want to avoid using chemicals as to the least suitability as we can. And I know lots of backyard gardeners that don't use any chemicals and it's not just a like going organic or I'm doing this. It's just, there's not a need for it. Um, and your gardening situation could vary. Um, I'm a backyard gardener where I grow things because I like being outside and I like the taste of freshly grown tomatoes more than the ones in stores, like supplementing my diet with stuff that I'm growing. But at the end of the year, if my squash plant dies and I have to go buy it, I'm okay with that. There are some people, on the other hand, that are growing 
for the solely for their food production. So they have a little bit more investment in what they're doing. So I would um, challenge you to sort of, as you're going through and dealing with pest problems, think about where you fit in, in the backyard gardening finance, like what your goals are. If you think back to that first talk that we had, if you attended and how that fits. So like, I'm never going to use chemicals in my backyard because it's not worth the money to me go buying the chemicals on something when it's cheaper for me just to go to the farmer's market and, and buy fresh produce if I need it. But again, if you're in a different situation, you just need to evaluate that out. Um, but ideally what we want to do is do a lot of prevention, a lot of physical and cultural sanitation. We want to rely on those natural enemies. And then if you do need chemicals, there are some options. I will include those in throughout this talk, um, but we're always going to use soft chemicals. So things like insecticidal soap, beam oils, um, BT are where the preferred ones. These are ones that are pretty easy for you guys as homeowners to access. And they're pretty safe for you guys as homeowners to use. If you do have to use chemicals, every chemical has what we call a label on it, which is directions on how to use it. I recommend that you read them and follow them. A lot of times chemicals fail because you're not treating the thing that the chemical is meant for, or you're not actually following those directions. Okay. So now we're going to get into my actual real talk. So we're going to talk about some general insect pests that you would find on all kinds of vegetable crops in your backyard. Then I'm going to talk about a few pests that you would find on coal or crucibles. So these are going to be cabbages and Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, crops that are sort of teetering off if you did spring plantings, but you may do a fall planting up later. Then we'll talk about solanaceous crops. And then finally, our cucurbit. If you are growing things like beans or corn or leafy greens, I'm not going to cover those in this talk just because we have limited amount of time. But again, HDIC has lots of information about all of them. Okay, so the two general pests I'm going to talk about are thrip, these guys, and aphids, which are these. Both of these are tiny, small insects that you will probably see better with a hand lens, but you can see with your naked eye versus something like spider mites or even smog. We'll feed on a wide variety of hosts listed here. So beans, your coal crops, your cucurbits, eggplants, onions, peppers, tomatoes. There's lots of different species of thrip. The species that feeds on one doesn't necessarily feed on the other, but I'm going to, again, treat them as kind of a general overarching group for this talk. Um, they tend to be small, kind of a yellow-brown coloration. You'll see them generally May through September. Um, with our warmer weather, sometimes they'll continue into November if your plants are still going, but generally these are going to be like spring, summer, into fall pests. Our common species that you're going to encounter here are going to be the eastern and western flower thrip. There's, um, the picture here is the western flower thrip. And then onion thrips are ones that you're going to find on alula crops. So the onion thrip is specific to things like onions, garlics, and so forth. I'm not going to touch too much on those in this talk because those are a little bit more of a specialty vegetable. Here's a picture of a flower and you can see, so these are the thrips here. So when I say that they're small, they are rather small. There are predatory thrips as well. So if you encounter what you think are thrips on your plants, what I recommend doing is when you flip over that leaf is just to sit and watch. Just like large mammal, predatory insects tend to be active and more moving rather than herbaceous. So if you are looking at your flower and you're noticing that the thrips are moving around a lot and they look like they're hunting, they're probably predatorial. So I always say like, Think of like a wolf or a lion versus like a deer or a gazelle. Like if I'm a deer and I find a good area to eat, I'm just going to stand there and eat versus if I'm a wolf in order to find my food, I constantly have to be like hunting for it. So it's the same analogy. Rips produce this kind of rasping, sucking, stippling damage. So this will happen on your leaves, like on the underside, on like a coal. So this would be like cabbage. This is what it would look like on a tomato. So it's this sort of little stippling damage. Now this tomato is completely edible. If I were a farmer, I couldn't sell it, but it's just skin deep. So particularly if you were doing things like canning or cooking and chopping it up in like a stew or something, you could 100% still eat this tomato. And then this is what the damage would look like on uh, like leafy greens. So leafy greens are probably where these guys are going to be a bigger concern. But again, on particularly young plants, they can do some stunting and some damage. If it's are another one that's pretty common on a lot of different plants, because we'll get several different species that you'd find. These guys are a true bug, which means they have a piercing sucking mouth part. So they are going to be feeding on kind of the xylem and the phloem and the plant tissue, but they're not going to do chewing damage. So you're not going to have holes in your leaves because of these guys. You're going to have like 
yellowing um, and like leaf girls. So here's a picture of like heavy feeding on a watermelon plant. So you can see how the leaves are kind of curled up and that's from aphid feeding. You commonly find these guys May through June is when they start appearing. When we get to the heat of the summer, normally our natural enemies have started to take control of them. And then you'll get them coming back in the fall as well. These are rather soft bodied. A lot of insects like to feed on them because they're basically like big sacks of like sappy sugar water because that's what they're feeding on. So easy ways that you can control them is keeping weeds down around your garden. Because they are so small, a heavy stream of water can wash a lot of them off. So I wouldn't recommend this again if your plants are really tiny because they haven't really built up some harshness, but by like July or August, especially if you've got like water or tomato and pepper plants that have like a good stock up there, you could take your hose and you could squirt those plants down, preferably earlier in the morning so that they have time to die, to dry um, and getting underneath those leaves. But any aphids you have on there, that'll wash a lot of them off. And these insects are so small, they're not going to be able to get back up on your plant. Biocontrol is a big one. So you've got things like lacewing larvae, ladybug larvae, and then parasitic wasps that will all prey on top of these guys. And then if you do have a plant that's really heavy in aphids, your other option is just to remove. If you've got a whole big garden, say you have like a, a half acre or your homesteading, rip one plant out if it's really bad before it spreads to others. So some general things for both aphids and thrips would be to inspect any transplants you have. If you started your own transplants at home, you're probably okay. But if you're buying them, particularly from a big box store, I would recommend always flipping over those leaves and checking before you purchase it and bring it home. Again, both aphids and thrips have a lot of predators and particularly aphids have parasitoids. So this is what they look like after they've been parasitized. What that basically means is that this wasp here is taking its uh, ovipositor and it's jamming it in the aphid and she's laying an egg and her larvae will grow up inside this aphid. And then when you see these circles there, basically that wasp has grown up inside, the aphid has swollen up and it has chewed its way out. That's the perfect circle here. So these are dead aphids. This one here is alive, but these three are dead. We call them mummy. So if you come across a bunch of these on your plant, they're, they're not feeding, they're not harming it. Just leave them alone. You can use things like horticultural oils, neem oils, and those insecticidal soaps to control these guys. I do not recommend using Dawn dish detergent as a control method. Um, a lot of people don't realize this because we call it dishwashing soap or Dawn soap, but it's a detergent, which means it has a soap and then it has a bunch of other stuff in it. If you're using it once or twice, it's okay, but I've seen studies where people have used it repeatedly and it has taken the wax coat off of their plant. It makes them more susceptible to like heat damage and water loss and other things like that. So I generally say, yes, Dawn detergent is cheap, but comparatively, insecticidal soap is meant for this. So that kind of takes care of a broad topic of a bunch of ones that you'll find out anything. So now we're going to zero in on some of these crops more specifically. So your crucibles is going to be things like your coals or your brassicas. So cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. These are ones that if you planted them in the springtime, you're probably getting ready if you haven't harvested them yet to harvest them and yank them out to replace with summer crowds. So we're just going to hit a few of these basic insect pests that you would find. The flea beetles are probably the first insect pest that you would find at the beginning of the season. Um, likewise, if you were going to do fall plantings of these, these will be one of the first one that comes in the fall. They emerge in April and May. You get one to two generations. So the generations kind of overlap with like when a spring would be they dip down. And then when you get those fall ones, you'll, they'll come back because that second generation, they get their names because the adults have these jumping legs in the back. Um, and they're rather small looking. And if you turn over your leaf and you'll see them, they'll, they'll be jumping around. The larvae will feed on the roots of plants, but the adults do what we call this shotgun feeding damage, which is this right here. Typically, you'll also find these on eggplants, but it's a different species. So there's one species that likes to feed on brassicas, and there's a different species that likes to feed on eggplants, and there's another species that'll feed on things like corn. There's also some species that'll feed on ornamentals. Um, as well, but they're different species and they don't tend to cross over. Like if I'm specialized to feed on one, I'm not going to jump over to another. So there's a close up <coughs> of what their feeding damage looks like. So again, because they're small beetles, they just tend to do small little damage holes. When your plants are larger near the end of the season, this isn't as important, but when you've got those small transplants and you only have three leaves, this can be super detrimental. So some easy ways 
to reduce the likelihood of this happening in your garden is to keep your garden clean. Sanitation is a general rule all around here. You're going to see it's the number one thing I'm going to say is keep your garden clean. Try to keep your weeds down as much as you can because these guys over winter in the soil you are doing you can do tillage although that sometimes as if you recall if you were here from Mark Tolson's talk it can destroy that entire soil community so it's a generally speaking I don't normally think these guys normally outbreak enough to the point where I would say that you need to do it in a backyard setting but it is an option particularly if you are doing large scale and if you're already tilling anyways it could be a bonus in this because on your coal crop you don't need them to be pollinated you are going to harvest all of these before they flower anyways floating row covers are a great option which is just a very thin fabric that you drape over the plant. Flint clay is also something that you can use. It's just a clay coating that goes over the plants that makes it hard for the insect to chew through. And then there are some insecticides you can use. But again, I've never heard of flea beetles outbreaking in backyard gardenings enough to justify an insecticidal spray. So harlequin bugs is another one that I oftentimes get people calling or were sending emails in. Um, stink bug, they are bright orange, as you can see. They have these really cool eggs that are barrel shaped, that are black and white. And then the nymphs also have that orange pattern. We get two to three per generation. They've got a piercing sucking mouth part. So they're not going to be like aphids where they're feeding on the sap, but these guys are going to jab their mouth into like the leaf tissue and they're going to suck up the cells in the leaves. So they're going to feed on leaf and you're going to get kind of this brown damage that's happening here. So this damage here is from Harlequin and then you'll get sort of droopy leaves if they feed early on it as they sort of die back. So again, here's more of what you can see the damage looking like. If it's near the end of the season, and this is on something like broccoli, I probably wouldn't bother controlling it, but on something like collards or cabbage, you may want to control it because that's the part that you're kind of feeding more on. You can manually crush the eggs. You can hand pick off the adults and the nymphs. You can tap them into a cup of soapy water. Like that's a great use for Dawn dish detergent rather than spraying it on your plant mix them up in a cup and just drown insects in it. That's a much better use than I think spraying on that. Floating row covers are a good one. So remove heavily infested plants. So there's three main types of caterpillars that you're going to find on brassicas. Um, and again, I can do an entire talk on each one of these. So this is sort of a quick run through. But you're going to have the imported cabbage worm, which are the cabbage white butterflies that we all see. There's cabbage loopers, and then there's diamondback moth. So the cabbage white is normally the most common pest that we find in backyard garden. The diamondback moth tends to be one that you find more in the fall because it comes up from the south. And then imported cabbage worms is another one that you kind of find end of growing season in spring, and then you tend to find it more heavily in the fall. Their feeding tends to be a little bit more voracious. You tend to get like these bigger holes in your leaves. Typically, you find large amounts of frass which is a fancy word for bug poop. Feeding tends to be in between the veins rather than along the edges like beetles would do. And again, a lot of your plants, particularly later in the seasons, can tolerate this. Cabbage is probably the one where you need to focus the most on it because they'll get into the head and that'll be tricky. And broccoli is another one because even if they're not feeding, no one wants to go home and like cook up broccoli and have like caterpillars in there. So my biggest recommendation is using floating row covers, if at all possible, because you're just excluding them completely from it. And again, you don't need to, these plants don't need to be pollinated. So that's probably the easiest way to do it. You can hand pick them as well. There are some insecticides, but I think uh, particularly later in the growing season, getting a chemical in like a cabbage head or a broccoli or cauliflower gets really tricky. So I generally don't discourage it at all. Another thing to do is anytime you're buying things from a store is always check those transplants ahead of time. So this was a picture someone took at a big box store and there's a cabbage white right there and he's, he's just laying her eggs on this transplant. So someone would come and they'd buy that, taking it home and planting it and it already has a problem. So, so now we're going to move into the solanaceous crops and these are the ones that a lot of people plant uh, during the summertime. So these are your tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplants, some of the common ones that you would encounter with them. I've already talked about flea beetles, so I'm not going to touch flea beetles again, but just note that they can be an issue on eggplants really early in the season. You tend to, as that first population is out, you tend to not deal with them much later in the season. So just keep an eye on your eggplant transplants, but once they get larger than say like a soda can, so, or like six inches or so, you generally don't have to worry too much about them anymore. 
And then there are a few diseases, so blossom end rot is pretty common in tomatoes. And then they do have a few wilting diseases that I'll touch on quickly. The stink bugs, I think, are probably the biggest concern for tomatoes when it comes to farmers. Not so much always with backyard gardeners, but there's a wide variety of them. So you have things like our, the brown marmalade stink bug, you have our native brown stink bug, we get the southern green stink bug, you have both adults and nymphs to be cautious of. It's worth noting that not all stink bugs are bad though. So we do have some predatory stink bugs. So this is the two spotted stink bug. This is the spined shoulder uh, stink bug. And here's like a nymph and you can see this is this proboscis right here. After this caterpillar, he's eating this caterpillar. This caterpillar is like massive compared to him, but he's eating it. It's gonna die. Um, so these guys have a piercing sucking mouth part, but they're predatory instead. So if you come across one of these guys on your plants, you want to leave them. And again, if you come across an insect and you don't know what it is, try your best to get a clear picture of it and you can submit it to the Home and Garden Information Center's Ask Extension and they can try to identify it or there are several kind of apps online um, or even Google Image is really good on identifying a lot of these backyard garden pests because they're pretty common. The stink bug damage, because they've got that piercing sucking mouth part, tends to be damage. So it's things like dents and sweet corn or it's this shadowy cloudy look and things like peppers and tomatoes. On green beans, it can be a little bit more detrimental, but like both this tomato and this pepper are still completely edible. So from like a backyard gardener perspective, you could still eat these, you could still harvest them. So you don't necessarily need to control stink bugs unless you're looking for like that pristine produce, which I would encourage you to not expect because if you're trying to get that, you're gonna spend a lot of time and energy in your backyard, which isn't necessarily needed. Um, I've eaten many stink bug tomatoes throughout my life and I'm still here. They are hard to control. And again, that damage tends to be nuisance only. You can get some biocontrol, specifically a lot of parasitic wasps like to lay their eggs and stink bug eggs. So putting things like flowers around your crops can really help bring in that. And then again, controlling those weeds around your field. Colorado potato beetle um, is a pest on both potatoes and eggplants. And if you've grown either, you have probably encountered this. This is a native insect that has pretty voracious. We tend to get two generations per year and they tend to overlap. So you'll get that first generation coming out May, April. So right about now, um, they'll lay eggs and then that next generation will kind of build up all summer long. These guys are voracious feeders. They are massive chewers. They will chew um, all the way down to kind of the stumps and they will also chew holes in eggplants itself. Here you can see, so these are the larvae feeding. They're, this one's like a larger larvae. Here's some younger ones, but you can fee see that they will chew potato and eggplants down to the vein. So you can crush the eggs. You can crush the larvae. You can drown the adults. I find the adults to be a little hard sometimes to do. Floating row covers can be really useful early on. So like if you had potatoes and eggplants in your garden now, you probably um, have a few weeks before they're going to bloom. And until they bloom, you don't really need them to be pollinated. So you can put on floating row covers because you've got that first generation coming out now. And you can avoid the buildup by pushing off that infestation as long as possible. So if you have floating row covers, use them. There are some predators that distinctly like to feed on like the eggs and the larvae. So here's that two spotted stink bug again, and it's got its proboscis right here stabbed in this larvae, and it's just sucking out all of its juices. There's a ladybird beetle feeding on Colorado potato beetle eggs. So there are some predators out there. There is some distinct types of BT powder that distinctly on beetles. So if you're going to do BT, you need to read the label to make sure that you are using the one for beetles and not the one for caterpillars because there's two different types of BT. Rosin is also another one or seven I've seen people use. You can use like a ground cover like straw or something. Sometimes that inhibits them from moving from one plant to another, but all around these guys are sort of just a tricky pest to control. They have a lot of resistance built up. So this is a tricky one even for ag professionals out in the field. So another one that you will likely encounter distinctly if you grow tomatoes would be hornworms or sphinx moths. So these are the big green caterpillars that have this little horn. A lot of times you'll notice their poop, which is square shaped first. 
because they do camouflage in a lot. Early on in the season, you need to control them. Later on, your plants normally have enough tissue that they're not going to be too much of a damage. I've been growing tomatoes for years and years and years and have never had an issue with these guys. But I do know some people will get hit really bad and they will have some defoliation like what's seen here. There are some species of caterpillars that will feed directly on the tomato, like the one that I showed earlier. These guys will do that as will the fruit worm. So if you seeing that happening, again, balance out how many tomatoes are you losing to these versus the cost of, say, applying an insecticide or something like that. Some easy things that you can do with hornworms. One fun thing that you can do is they fur less under a black light. So you can get an app to modify your smartphone or you can invest in just a small, cheap hand light and you can go out as soon as the sun set. This is really fun with kids. If you shine it over them, they will for less. They will be like a bright blue color. So it makes it really easy to hand pick them out. If you have backyard chickens, you can throw them all to your chickens as well. Um, these guys also get parasitized, which is what you're seeing here. So each one of these little white things is a parasitic wasp cocoon. And as soon as you see one like this, this caterpillar is no longer feeding on your plant. And it's better to leave this alone because each one of these wasps will go out and will parasitize another caterpillar just like this. Again, I've rarely found these to get to the point where they need heavy control in case of insecticides. If you do get to that point, I would look on HGIC for some recommendations. The blossom end rod is something that you see in a lot of solanation crops. So here we see it on a pepper. It's really common, particularly in your first round of tomatoes. You can also get this on squash. This is a nutrient disorder that happens. Um, and what it basically is, is your fruit is enlarging faster than the plant can put calcium into. It. Sometimes this is from a lack of calcium in your soil. Sometimes it's too much water. Sometimes it's too little water. Sometimes it's a pH issue. A lot of times you'll get it your first round of tomatoes, but if you harvest those tomatoes, the next round will be perfectly clean. Just sort of evaluate where they are. If you've done your due diligence, if you've gotten a soil test, if they're getting plenty of water, harvest that first round and see if your second round gets better. So tomatoes are also pretty vulnerable to several different wilt diseases. Bacteria wilt is one that will clog up the zone and will cause them to wilt. Fusarium wilt's another one that causes this weird yellowing pattern. Um, the best thing that you can do is to plant a resistant variety. And most varieties that you're gonna find in the stores that are hybrid are gonna have resistance to them. If you really wanna do an heirloom variety and you're having issues with this, I would recommend next year, get a grafted variety. So this is when they put a heirloom top on a stock for one that's resistant because a lot of these diseases are soil diseases. Um, and there's tons of information about this in our home and garden information center, as well as lots of other sites. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we've got about 15 minutes and I wanna do all of our cucurbits before you guys go. And another prefla of diseases and kind of pests. So we'll dive in. So I get you guys out of here in a timely manner. One of the first pests that a lot of people think of when they think cucurbits is cucumber beetles. Um, these are going to be about a quarter of an inch. Um, and they typically are yellow. They come in both the spotted and the striped. And these are two different species. So they're going to have different habits to them. They come out at different times. So the spotted one has two to three generations per year. They overwinter in the south and tend to migrate up as we're sort of dealing with a changing climate and we have these milder winters. If you're in southern Maryland or here on the shore, they're starting to be able to overwinter here. So we're getting them a little bit earlier than normal. Um, if you're in northern Maryland or in, a, in like western, so Allegheny and Garrett, you guys are probably still not getting them to overwinter yet. Our striped ones only have one generation per year and they are uh, will start emerging kind of in the spring and they'll normally die off around August because that's when they do. So these are season long pests that you will encounter. They tend to feed on the leaves and feeding damage isn't necessarily the big concern as much as the striped one will transmit bacteria wilt and the spotted one can transmit some viruses. So this is what their feeding damage looks like. So here, sometimes they'll feed on the rinds of cucurbits. So in this case, this is a cucumber, but they'll also feed on pumpkins, watermelons, and squashes. From a backyard perspective, this is still technically edible. You might want to cut this bit off, but if it's super heavy feeding, you can have like bacteria or other fungal diseases in there. So you do sort of want to control them within reason. And then you can see they will also feed on the leaves and they'll make this kind of scattered ratty looking 
to them as well. So some things that you can do to control them is removing debris around your garden, particularly at the end of the season, or if you have a plant that has been heavily feeded on or one that's got like bacteria, well, like this one, remove it from your garden, put it in a black plastic bag and throw it away. The longer it sits in the garden, the bigger that pest population is going to grow on it and the more likely it's going to be to spill over to your other plants. This is another one where you can use those floating row covers until the plant begins to bloom. The curbits do need to be pollinated in order to produce any fruit. So you will have to take it off once they start producing flowers, but you can buy some time to reduce that population by putting up a floating row cover. You can buy disease resistant plants right off the bat. And a lot of places that you will get seeds that'll say like resistant to this virus or resistant to this thing. So that's a nice way to sort of not have to worry so much about these beetles because you know they've already got the disease there. Carolyn clay is a clay powder that covers your plant. Good to sort of start them off early. Again, you can also use cups of soapy water and just kind of hand pick and destroy them. So squash bug is one that I know is the bane of a lot of people's existence. This one is really common on squash and pumpkins. You don't see it as much on things like watermelons and cucumbers. You get two generations per year. They'll start coming out in May, early June, and they'll last all throughout the summer into the fall. You tend to find them on the underside of the leaves or around the fruit and the stalks. So the adults are kind of this black shape. The nymphs can be anywhere from bright red to kind of gray. And then they have these coppery egg masses. They can vector some diseases. So getting resistant varieties can be useful, um, but their feeding damage can cause stippling damage as well as it can cause leaves to wilt. So here you see some heavy feeding damage and you can see that the leaves are sort of starting to die back. So um, early detection is kind of key. You can pick those susceptible varieties. This is another one where a heavy stream of water, a lot of times when you're dealing with these small nymphs can be really useful. Another neat one that works is if you make a loop of duct tape, you can roll it across these egg masses and just pick the egg masses right off the squash plant. So if you're out in your garden every single day anyways and you're checking, just taking those egg masses off before they hatch can really help reduce your numbers. Things like horticulture and neem oils work really well on the nymphs as well. It's really hard to control the adults though. So you wanna target the nymphs. So squash vine borer is probably <laughs> Uh, the backyard gardener's worst nightmare for squash, but it's really common in squash in backyard gardens because what happens is the moth lays its egg right at the base of your plant and the caterpillar burrows in. It kills your plant, but you don't know that it's there until your plant's basically dead. And there's not a necessary lot that you can do. We used to say that you could plant early or delay and plant later, but with climate change, we're sort of realizing that time range isn't really working because we're instead of getting one generation per year, we're now getting two. Um, so this one's just kind of a tricky one. I generally don't recommend people plant squash anymore in their backyard. Instead, I think it's easier just to, to go to your local farmer's market and buy it. But if you really want to, you can check the HGIC. We do have some tips for it, but it is kind of a trickier pest to control. Floating row covers can be used before it starts to flower. You can kind of keep an eye on that base stem. And when you start to see this orange frass, you can use a razor blade to cut in and pull out the larvae. And then you can wrap the stock up and rebury it. And squash plants will put off roots off of that. The problem is, is you kind of constantly have to keep doing that. I've heard people talk about doing like aluminum foil around the base, but the problem is they'll just go above or below the aluminum foil. So you can try it if you'd like, but it sort of comes with like hit and missing. Um, if you do have a plant that is infested, remove it as soon as you can, bag it and toss it. So another common one that you get, particularly on the summer squash, is this one, which is Coleoptera rot. You'll see this and they think they have blossom end rot, but it's fuzzy. So by blossom end rot, you're going to have just an all brown kind of squash. This one's going to have this fuzzy like fungus here. And this generally is just from your plants coming in contact with the soil and having a lot of excess water on them. So you can't always control this. The best thing I recommend doing is if you have this, like just prune these ones out. So as soon as you see this rot here, come through with your clippers, just cut these guys out, harvest the rest of your squash. Um, if you put down like straw or a plastic tarp or something to prevent that contact, you can reduce it. But again, normally you'll have a few 
fruit that you'll lose to this, but it's, it's not going to kill your plant. So downy and powdery mildew are two other ones that you commonly will get on some squash plants. So powdery mildew is going to have like this white fungal looking on both the top and the bottoms. The leaves will turn yellow and eventually shrivel up. Um, it's going to reduce the number of fruits you're going to get around here. We typically don't get it until mid to late summer. So by then your plants might already be on their way out. Downy mildew um, is caused by a water mold, not a fungus. And it's generally going to be more angular and it's going to be yellow looking on the top. So some things that you can do to not have to deal with these as much is, would be to get some resistant variety. There's not necessarily anything that's fully resistant, but there'll be some that are more resistant. So just planting those already alleviates some of the headache. Doing best management practices distinctly with water. So most squash prefers to be watered at the base of the plant. So if you have a drip irrigation system or if you're hand watering, water down at the base. Don't, don't water on the top of the leaves and that'll help reduce it. If you do notice this early on, particularly on like a handful of leaves, you can clip those leaves out. Or again, if you've got one infested plant, just remove it. You can use some chemical options. So things like copper sulfates and stuff, but generally speaking, these tend to come later in the season. And by that point, your plants are probably on their way out. Financially speaking, I don't normally talk about using chemical controls. I think your money's better spent buying a resistant variety up front. So sort of a quick and dirty overview of some things you guys may encounter this year. And I'll take any questions if there are any. Hey, Emily. We just got a little bit in the chat here. Uh, David writes, I was trying to figure out if that was a reference to the STEM or uh, STEM um, in terms of STEM education. Um, and I I don't know part you were talking about STEMs, but I'm pretty sure you were talking about the plant, right? Yeah, I feel like okay. I probably would be talking about that more so. I mean, all this would fall under STEM education to some extent, but uh, I yeah. assume I'm talking more plant STEM. Okay, we have another question asking you basically to expand on neem oil. How would you apply it? How much do you dilute it? And then do you want to apply it at full strength? I'm assuming that's undilute. Yeah. So the answer to this is going to vary depending on what you buy. So this goes back to the, you need to read the label. So every chemical is going to have a slightly different label. You can buy neem oil at different concentrations. So how much you need to dilute it is going to vary based on what product of neem oil you're buying. So what I recommend doing is when you go to the store and you buy it, they're going to have the directions on the back, but they're going to be super tiny. So when you get home, go on to Google, type in the exact brand of neem oil that you're in and put in pesticide label after it. And if you go to their website, they'll have a PDF of that label. And that will tell you what you need to do. So if it's at a 20% concentration, you may need to dilute it down to 10. If it's at a 10%, you could use it straight, but it's going to vary. So you, that's where reading the label is going to help. And that's also going to vary on what your plants you're applying it to. You might use a higher concentration on a solanaceous than you would on a, a cucurbit or something like that. I don't know it off the top of my head because it's going to vary for each single one. Um, so you need to read the label for that. And again, if you can't find the label, there should be a 1-800 number, call them, call them and ask them, like, can you send me a PDF of your label? Can you explain to me if I'm trying to apply it for this, what, what my concentration should be? The other important thing to look on that label is what your personal protective equipment is. You should never be applying a chemical in flip-flops or bare feet. Even neem oil can cause burns if you're applying it wrong. So you need to make sure that you're making sure that you're safe with it. You should also probably always have some sort of eye protection on because that stuff will sting if you get it in your eyes. And I know that from personal experience. So yeah, you would just, you'd want to look at the label for the neem oil that you're distinctly using. Okay. And we have a follow-up neem oil question. Does it wash off when it rains? And then would it need to be reapplied after it rain? So it sort of does and it sort of doesn't. So the perk of using neem oils versus something like an insecticidal soap that is only effective when it's wet is that neem oil is mildly systemic, meaning it will contact kill, but a lot of times it will also be mildly absorbed by a plant as well. So neem oil tends to last a little bit longer and it is a little bit more effective on larger insects than say like an insecticidal soap would be. And again, looking at the directions would matter. 
most of the times it's a contact one when we're talking about vegetable gardening. So it's not even, it needs to be reapplied when it rains as much as like you apply it as soon as it's dry, it's safe again. So you may have to apply it and then wait a few days and go out and see if it killed those insects and reapply then. But I would generally recommend not applying any of these in the morning if you know it's going to rain in the afternoon. Again, if you're doing overhead irrigation, because that's the only way you can, you would want to water first thing in the morning, apply the stuff, and then give it all day to work. Okay. Anthony asks if there's any way to promote or bring in beneficial predators or insects into the garden. Yeah. So that's a great question. The best thing that you can do is do um, is have flowers. Things like parasitic wasps lay their eggs in other insects, but they as adults don't feed on other insects. They tend to feed on flowers. So having things like marigolds or asters or native plants in and around your garden is great. Having things like straw mulch is like a great habitat for things like ground beetles. So if those caterpillars were to fall off the plant and they land on the ground, a ground beetle is going to gobble them up. Same earwigs, all these beneficial things like having those alternative habitats. So having a more diverse habitat will definitely increase them. I don't in general recommend buying natural enemies. Sometimes you can go online and you can Google like ladybird beetles and people, you can spend like $20 and they'll mail you like a hundred or so. Those tend to be the Asian ladybird beetle, which is a non-native one. It's not quite invasive. Um, but the other thing is when you put that stuff in your garden, it'll fly away. So I tend to just tell people make your garden more of a diverse habitat. And the best things to do is flowers, ground mulches. If you are going to use chemical treatments, things like insecticidal soap doesn't hurt ladybird beetles. They're too big. Soap works by clogging up the air holes that insects use. So it works well on things like thrips and aphids because they're so tiny. A ladybird beetle or like a honeybee, if it gets on them, they can clean it off. That's the other reason I recommend using true insecticidal soap rather than Dawn dishwashing detergent because the detergent they can't clean off. It's got extra chemicals to make it stick. The detergent works on your dishes because it cuts through the oil and the oil is theoretically what kills insects and why it's going to kill the bad insects. It's also going to kill the good insects. So the soap is the better ecological one to you. So hopefully that helps answer your question. If you go to HGIC, we have a whole page about how to integrate and bring biocontrol into your garden. But the best thing I can say right off the bat is just to plant some flowers in a mixture of vegetables. Okay, last question. Uh, when using the product 7, which I believe is Carbaryl, how long do you need to wait in order to consume the fresh produce? You know, I would need to look at the label. I don't know that off the top of my head. But again, any product that you're using, read the label because that's going to tell you how long you need to wait before you can harvest it as well. Most of the stuff that you find as a homeowner, like things like the soaps and the oils, you can wash them and consume. But I generally would say like, if you're going out there and you see that there's tomatoes or squash or peppers that are ready to get picked, pick them first and then apply the chemicals. But I want to say seven, I don't think would have more than a week wait period, but I would check the label because again, you're going to have, depending on the product you're using, it might be different concentrations as well. So I would check the label. And if you want, my email address is right there. You can shoot me an email if you can't find the label and I will help you find it. Yeah. Sorry, we have one more question that just came in. Can food grade diatomaceous earth be used in the garden? Any suggestions for how to use it? So you can use it. One thing to note about diatomaceous earth is it is sort of something that you're going to use on the ground. So you're going to put that around the base of your plants. If you're looking for something to control on the plants, Carolyn clay is the better option, but that will get washed off anytime it rains. So diatomaceous earth work well if you're having kind of ground things. I tend to find that a lot of your pests on vegetable plants aren't ground pests though. So I tend to say like a heavy stream of water works a little bit better on a lot of the pests we're talking about today. It's one that I recommend if people are having issues with like ants in their garden or something like that, that's kind of a better alternative. Hit and miss on whether or not it works on slugs because slugs don't have an exoskeleton and that's how diatomaceous works is by scratching up exoskeletons. So if you're dealing with slug issues, don't. I generally have found that it does not work on them. Um, but if you just want to do like a border around to keep things like ants and stuff out, 
you can, but then you're keeping out a lot of your beneficial things like ground beetles. So it's sort of, it's a hit and miss. Some people love it. Some people don't. I have mixed feelings about it, but you just would want to put it around the base of your plant. All right. I think that's all we've got um, in terms of questions. So, oh, sorry. All right. One more just came in. Epsom salt use in the garden. Myth or useful? Um, how do I use it? So I generally discourage people from using any type of salt in your garden. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're using the salt for. I've never heard of it being used for an insect thing. I know some people have talked about using salts for weeds. The problem is, is once salt is in your soil, it's hard to get it out without just adding lots of water. Any of those sort of home remedy things, it's the same thing with the Dawn dishwashing soap. Like there are people online, you can find probably find blog articles where people use them. But if there's no scientific backing and EPA hasn't approved it, the safety issues is sort of my bigger concern. So it's not something I would recommend. I'm not even quite sure what you would be using it for. Okay, there's a follow-up here. Okay. And I, I kind of am going to add to it. So Epsom salt supposedly increase yield is what mm. this person is saying. Uh, what I know about Epsom salts is they are a way to add um, potassium to your okay. garden. Right. Or sorry, not potassium, um, magnesium. Magnesium. Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. If you do a soil test and you're low in magnesium, and I th I feel like they also have sulfur, but I have to look that up um, because there are certain times when you would add Epsom salts. They're just like a salt compound that will break into these two nutrients that are basically micronutrients that you wouldn't really need to add unless they're deficient in your soil. So if you get a soil test back and uh, it says that you're deficient in um, magnesium, that's when you would think about applying Epsom salts. But then you'd still need to make sure that you figure out how much um, to apply. And I don't know what percentage um, Epsom salts are potassium. So th there's some math there and figuring out how much to apply. And then I think it, uh, there's a follow-up here. How to add calcium? Uh, sorry, how do you add calcium to your garden? So if you do have blossom end rot, uh, rot how do you deal with that? Um, so the first thing I would do is make sure that you get a soil sample to make sure that it's not an issue of like pH in your soil, because a lot of times people will have plenty of calcium but they, their pH will be off or something else like that is. And then from there, you can do a few different things. A lot of times, um, some things like compost, a lot of times will have calcium in it, or there's some other things that you can add. Um, I know people will talk about like doing pulverized eggshells and stuff. The problem with that is it normally takes a whole growing season for that calcium to really break down and get in. I think there's some calcium line that you can do, but then you're shifting with the PA. I would recommend probably look on HGIC and they're going to probably have a better answer for you because that's more of a nutrient and less of an insect question. So yeah. so I did just look up Epsom salts. They are uh, magnesium and um, sulfate. So if you had a specifically a magnesium deficiency and then also a little bit of a sulfur deficiency, that's when you would be using that. I wouldn't just go out and apply it um, because those are both both micronutrients for plants. They're not like nitrogen, potassium, um, and phosphorus that plants need a whole lot of to grow. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, I think we don't have any more questions, at least that I see in the chat. Um, if you have any follow-up, please send us an email. We will be sending you email with uh, survey information uh, for the series, and um, we hope you all uh, enjoyed the ones that you got to watch and hopefully see you next year. Take care and everybody enjoy gardening. It's great outside. Go garden. Yep. It's that time of year. It Bye is. everybody.